Hi guys, it's Carrie Ann from Carrie Ann.com. Um, I Carrie Ann Todd.com actually, I just said my website name wrong. Um, <laughs> it's been a rough day homeschooling. That's, that's there you go. You see it right there. Um, so I am here with Amber O'Neill Johnson. I am so excited to chat with her today. Um, this is my second episode of a homeschool invitation. Um, and I am just excited to chat um, with Amber. Uh, so this is, um, if you didn't catch the last episode, um, which was the first one, um, this is just kind of a way for me to encourage, I feel like we're living in a crazy time right now. And there's a lot more people homeschooling or home overseeing their child's education um, than there ever have been before. And I feel like in that it can get really messy because everybody wants to do the best they can do for their kids. And a lot of people are kind of in this um, in this space where they're having to think about things they never had to think about before when it came to their child's education. And how do we do this? And what does it look like? And what do we need? And all of that. And so I just wanted to provide a space um, where I could talk to other homeschool moms who are in the thick of it and ask them some questions and just get their insight um, on how they do it every day with their kids. So the full interview that I did with Amber um, is going to be up on my blog, but I want to give her um, just an opportunity to introduce herself. Um, and also then I'm going to ask her a few questions um, that you'll also find the answers to on the blog, but this way she can kind of expound on them and you can hear her voice. So Amber, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name's Amber. I live outside of Atlanta, further and further outside of Atlanta every time <laughs> I do, um, in Georgia. And I'm married to Scott. We have four kiddos. We are in birthday season right now, but soon mm. they will be five, seven, nine, and 11. Um, we've homeschooled from the beginning and um, I follow typically the Charlotte Mason philosophy of education. And um, yeah, and I blog about that and how Charlotte Mason wears an Afro in my house um, <laughs> at heritagemom.com. Yes, I love that. I was I was rereading over your bio while I was like getting ready to put stuff up on the blog and I was like, she wears one in my house too. Like <laughs> I just I love that. I love it so, so much. Um, so have you guys always done Charlotte Mason? Has that kind of always been? Um, since kindergarten age. So I think okay. like when I first started and we were doing like preschool homeschool, um, which thankfully I was, cause I have a tendency to be kind of cray. So thankfully <laughs> I was only reading to, um, my preschooler, but we were doing school. Um, and yeah. I wasn't familiar with her yet at that time. So we were doing the living book thing, but none of the rest of it. But by the time my oldest was, you know, five, I was well on my way. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, so if you are not familiar with Charlotte Mason, you can go read all about her. Um, but I definitely was, um, I found Amber's Instagram through um, Wild and Free. And I was just kind of drawn to you because we've been doing um, the Charlotte Mason. So we used to do like classical homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been doing Charlotte Mason for, this will be our second like full year. And I, in our first year was just like overwhelmed with the, like the breadth of it because it is a, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, if you look at all of Charlotte Mason, it's a lot. Um, but also was just kind of felt like um, it was lacking in color, <laughs> if that, um, yes. very lacking, very lacking in color. And that just, I just didn't know what to do about that. Um, because Charlotte Mason is so heavy on living books, not just, you know, not just any book, but, you know, good, good literature. And so, um, so yeah, I'm excited. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but, mm -hmm. um, so 
what is, if you had to like start all over, what is one piece of advice you wish somebody had given you about homeschooling? Oh my goodness. It would definitely be that um, I wish someone had told me to trust my instincts whenever mm. I get the sense that we've done enough. So that is an area where I struggled immensely early on. And so when I'm not careful, that's what rears its ugly head um, for me. It's just where my tendency lies to feel like we should be doing um, more, even though I feel like we've done enough, but mm -hmm. I maybe we haven't done everything that's on my lesson plans. And those could be lesson plans created by someone else or even the lesson plans I create myself. So this is a place where like my husband, he's just like, so you mean you're stressed about not doing what you said you should do <laughs> when you said you should do it? And like when he says it like that, I'm like, yeah, I know. It sounds yeah. really strange. But yeah, once I set that target, it's hard for me to move. But as I've been doing this for a longer time, I am learning that I'm almost always right. That mother gut is almost yeah. always right. And so for me, a lot of times that means that we're doing less than what I planned or maybe less than even someone else. But sometimes it also means we're doing more. So there are some things that aren't included in a typical you know, curriculum or that may not be on somebody else's lesson plans or they may not consider it to be very important, but I do. And so I might be adding that and I might at that time be saying like, okay, in this situation, enough is not enough. Like I, I want right. more and to be able to trust that as well. So I think that it's very easy for me because I always do have that feeling. It's just that my mind starts overriding what I know. Yeah. To do. So I yeah. think that I wish someone had said, just trust yourself. You're the mom for a reason. Right. I know. Yeah. I always like one of the, like a phrase that came to me like super early when I started, like in my mothering journey was that God trusted me with these kids. And so that means he trusts me, you know? And so that's, I mean, but that can feel like a weighty thing at times um, when you, you know, when you look at those little faces and you're like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a lot, you know? Um, but I also think it is, it is such a good thing. It's like, because God trusted you with your four and he trusted me with my two. And it doesn't mean that he, it doesn't mean that what he asks of us is exactly the same because right. your four are different than my two you know? That's right. That's right. And so that is where we do have to like lean into that intuition and, and be okay, you know, with that. If that looks like your family does a lot more in this area, or it looks like they do a lot less. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I think as a mom, for me, what that means is I have to like put my blinders on to um, to not compare my homeschool day or my child's writing or the number of books we've read to another mom or to a curriculum or to whatever. Yeah, I Which think that's hard. so true. I know it's so hard. And I even have the struggle within my own family of not comparing my kids. I mean, I do compare my kids. I don't know if you can ever not do it, but not right. taking action as a result of that comparison. So it's okay, yeah. for, I think, for me to note the differences, but not to have an emotional reaction to the differences. They are simply just differences. But, you know, I think you think that I've been in this homeschool game for a while here. And when the next kid comes along, oh, I got this. I know how to right. do this. And then the next kid, like, yeah, no, I don't, I'm not going to be that easy to teach. Yeah. It's not going to be that easy to teach me to read. Or, nope, I'm just not really going to be into writing. And I'm like, what? This other kid was over here writing <laughs> books. And now this kid's over here, like, I don't write books, you yeah. know? And so I think just like I have to watch that in my own family, then definitely when I'm looking outside. And I think it's a balance because sometimes – I think it's good to notice, but not to receive. And hmm. I guess the difference being that it is good to notice what other moms are doing because a lot of times your community and your peers can elevate your game. They can show you how to do something better or um, 
they can show you how to be more wise in a certain area. But I think it's like when you receive it and you start internalizing it, like what they're saying or what they're doing has to be mirrored exactly like that in your own home where the danger comes in. But, you know, sometimes it's good to have a friend who can peek over the fence and be like, hey, girl. I don't know what you're doing over there, but you know, <laughs> let me talk to you for a minute. I have a I have an idea that might work better for you, and I've appreciated that as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, good community that you trust is is huge. Yeah, um, definitely. And to, and to know that they like that you trust them, um, and that they trust you, and that that relationship is not you know not one of judgment. If you're, you know, if your child doesn't, um, you know, is not on the right, you know, particular reading level or math yeah. level, um, it's, it's huge. That's a, yeah. it's a really, it's a really important thing to have. Um, so, okay. So what would you say is your biggest challenge in homeschooling and how do you meet that challenge? Like, what do you do to meet that head on? Well, okay, so that one's easy for me because it's been the same big challenge forever. I would think that I would have mastered it by now, but mine <laughs> is definitely maintaining white space on mm. my schedule. So I feel that I'm pretty good at protecting my kids' time because I have a certain lifestyle that I want to um, promote for them, which is a lifestyle that includes rest and play and exploration like so many of us do, but yeah. I don't protect so fiercely that same space for myself. Hmm. So I tend to, when someone asks me to do something uh, at a certain day or time, I look on my calendar and there's nothing there for that day or time. So I say, yes. <laughs> um, and so what I realized though is what was there was nothing. And now I have no nothing left on my mm. calendar. Mm. And um, and let's be real, I'm never doing nothing. But that was probably where I would have sat in the, my big fluffy chair and crocheted. Or I may have gone on a walk around the neighborhood with my neighbor. Um, or I may have called an old friend. And so those are things that weren't in my calendar. But when I fill up all of my space with worthy things, that's the thing, the things I say, yes, yeah, they're worthy. Um, and so, yes, I'll do that Bible study with you, girlfriend. And Yes, I'll lead the Girl Scout troop. And yes, I would really like to be in charge of the food drive or, you know, all these number of things. Who wants to say no to any of those things? Right. Um, and so I think that what I've come to realize is that right now my main job is that of I have several jobs, but I'm a wife and a mother and a home educator and a household manager. And those are all, any one of those by themselves is like a job, right? And so yeah, I have yeah. four of them. Um, and I run a small business from home on top of that. And so my plate is really full. And so something that another thing my wise husband taught me is that my default answer is no. And mm. then like you can then think about it and come back and everyone will always allow you to revise to a yes, usually, unless you miss the boat. But he was like, you just need to say and think no first and then, yeah. and then upgrade to a yes later instead of um, just having a reflex of yes. That's so good. That's, that's really good advice because if you think about that, if you think about that also like upgrading to a yes, you know, if the person was mad at you because you said no, you know, now you saved the day because you yeah. came back and you saved, said yes, but you said it and you're, you have peace about that yes instead of the opposite of you said yes first. Yeah. And then, like, you lost sleep that night thinking, oh, my gosh, there's no way I can realistically do this. And right. then you have to say no and you're like – you're a horrible person, you know, yeah. <laughs> because you, I know. You I mean, it's that. Still, so. it's, it still happens to me right now. Like I have a project that I've committed to. I hope they're not listening right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I have just not been able to get it done because I'm so tired at night and then I'm getting up in the morning and now we've started school and I'm going to miss that deadline. And I feel horrible, like the guilt and I feel bad. And I honestly, it's like, my personality is that I don't ever do that, but I realize like I am at full capacity. 
yeah. right now. And so I just am, you know, I'm going to like do the best I can and like beg for mercy, but it's another lesson for me that I, yeah. I overcommitted. Yeah, absolutely. I, so, so our lives are very similar, like as far as, you know, obligations that you listed. And I remember like a couple years ago when I was first building my business and just kind of like, I tend to be a very competitive person. So I go like, you know, full steam ahead with anything. And I remember like asking my husband just because I, I felt like I was dropping the ball in like so many areas, you know? Yeah. And I remember asking him, I was like, what do you expect of me? Like, just, can you just like tell me? And I remember him saying he's, he like, you know, he kind of made a list and he had like three things on the list, you know, like, like he wanted me to be, you know, like, you know, a good wife. Like he wanted me to be, you know, a support for him. Yeah. He wanted me to like take care of our kids and make sure they had all their needs met as far as like, you know, all their food and, you know, yeah. clean clothes and all that our stuff. Clothes like, fit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, and then I, I want you to educate our kids. Like he was, I mean, it was like nowhere on there was it all, the, was there anything like the things I had put on my shoulders, yeah. you know, um, with a business or a job or, you know, anything like that. And I remember like I wrote it on a little post-it and I like put it on my desk. And I went through a period of like, when people would ask me to do things, I would like look at that list and I'm like, no, yeah. <laughs> because it's not, it's, it's not, not one, one of these things. things. Yeah. It's not one of the things. And like, it doesn't mean that's a forever thing. It doesn't sure. mean that's how you have to live forever. But if you do recognize you're in this season of taking on too much, sometimes you need somebody else to to kind of cast that vision for you of like, these are the things, th these are all the things I expect of you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, whether you, whether you have, whether it's God or your husband or a good friend or, you know, or somebody you trust needs to yeah. do that. And then it's totally okay. That's your permission slip to like, just kind of go with that for a while, you know, yeah. and, and make that white space in your calendar. So I, I think do so. think that's some, I do think that's something so many people, um, struggle with. So, okay. My last question for you, um, as a mother to children of color, how, um, do you make sure, um, that you teach this broad view of history? Um, I am very aware. I'm sure a lot of people are very aware that, um, the history we, we were taught is not necessarily, I, I, I don't think I would go so far as to say it's wrong, but it's one view yeah. um, of history. And um, as a mom, I know I don't want to perpetuate that with my kids. You know, I want, I want to lay this, you know, this feast before them of all of these views of what happened um, in certain, you know, lots of areas really not just certain areas but so how do you do that like how do you how do you lay out all of that to your kids well i think um one thing that's important for me that people know is like i am not a historian nor am i even a history buff um i before i started homeschooling the i can't express to you how ignorant i was about history mm -hmm. and also to really let you in how much I did not care. <laughs> um, so not only did I not know, I did not know, I mean, I didn't know and I didn't care that I didn't know. Um, it just wasn't an area that was of interest to me probably because in my education, it was just, it wasn't about me. It didn't include people like me and it was boring battles, dates. Hmm. That's all I really remember. Yeah. And so when I began teaching it to my children, um, using really good books, I realized that, huh, it's kind of interesting. And I would be reading and I'd be like, oh, she did, huh? And I, I mean, it was just like, I felt like it was like my little mom soap opera, like, oh no, he didn't. I can't believe that. And so I was like, this is really cool. I wish that I had been taught this way. So I knew I was like, the method was really good. And we had 
you know, we were reading these um, historical accounts and we would include historical fiction and biographies. But after a while, I was like, man, when are we going to get to the black people? Because I'm like, we keep reading and I'm like flipping ahead and I'm just like, really? A whole book. <laughs> it's like it's not in this book. Right? And I thought, that's really, that's really weird more than anything. I wasn't angry. I was more just like, why, why is that? And mm. what is that about? What does that mean? And um, so we have, I don't have time to get into all of it right now, but the short of it is my oldest daughter quickly let me know that it was not going to go down like that. Cause she was just like, she told me, she was just like, why aren't we in people like me in any of our books? Mm. And I was like, I don't know. And so I really committed to saying, I am ignorant. I do not know. But because of this little person in front of me, I would like to not recreate another version of me in that way. I will figure something out. And I'm still figuring it out. So mm -hmm. my history plans are imperfect, but I just dive in. I just went headfirst into the jello. It won't be great. It might not be wonderful, but it's going to be way better than where we were. Yeah. And so what I do is I basically, I follow a, a history time period for the school year. And I look for as many different black and brown voices that I can find for that time period. Or if I can't find their actual voices, then what they were doing. And if they weren't doing anything in the part of the world we're studying, then I'll go to a different part of the world mm. and say, while these people here were doing this, black people were doing this. And other people, I also focus a lot on Native Americans or indigenous peoples of the Americas. And I'm like, and this is what they were doing. And um, and I don't always do it evenly. Like the voices aren't always even. Some years, some school years, we've heard a lot more about a certain group of people. And other school years, we've heard a lot more. But I try to make sure everyone's heard across and over time. And it's not always through books. So we travel and we take the kids. And we took a big trip. We spent three months in South America. And we oh, spent wow. time, yeah, we spent time with indigenous people there and learning from them and getting to know um, their lifestyles and their stories. And um, so we didn't read a lot about them that year, but we were there, you know, right, and right. spending time. So there are other things that we do as well beyond just the books. But I, I don't know. I wish I had a great strategy, but here's what I do. Late at night when I should be sleeping, I am <laughs> online reading reviews. I read a ton of book reviews, okay? I look at um, the website Reshelving Alexandria. I have a membership there. And it's a, it's a website where they are housing. They house all of these different books. And you can search by everything. You can search by the age of the main character, how many children are in the family, what continent, what country. And so whatever it is I'm looking for, I can search on there. Um, uh, Charlotte Mason, um, uh, Charlotte Mason Living, Charlotte Mason Living, not Charlotte Mason Living. That's one of my Instagram hashtags. <laughs> I go there too. Um, Charlotte Mason in the city. She has um, a, a, like ongoing multicultural book list on her website and okay. you can look by different people groups and see like what history books she's recommending as well. I look at the parallel narrative. That's another website that's run. And all of these are, it's amazing to me. They're all run by homeschool moms. I and love so, it. <laughs> yours are none too shabby. Okay. These yep. are really smart ladies who are out there putting in the work and sharing it with other people. Um, and then I look at the Facebook group, Living Books for All Peoples, and, you know, read what they're talking about there. I'm kind of quiet on there because I'm mostly just soaking it in and listening yeah. to the conversation. I'm, liter I'm literally writing all these down. Don't think oh, I'm <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So, yeah. So I just spend, you know, my non free time reading through those types of websites, seeing what other people are recommending, looking, reading, researching, and I buy a lot of books. So that could be considered a downside to a lot of people. I spend a lot of money on books um, because I need to see how they treat, you know, how the author treats certain conversations. And sometimes I discard them. It's not what I'm interested in. Or I'll say maybe later, or maybe this kid it works with, but not that child. And so I'm constantly looking and, and doing that. So I guess I just am saying I don't really have 
a set way of doing it. I'm I'm kind of garage sailing. I'm yard yeah. sailing. When you think about it, you know, I'm not shopping at a particular store. I don't go to Macy's and buy the furniture. I go hit up all the yard sales. Well, that's yeah. how I feel about books. I'm just scrapping. I'm scrapping, looking, searching, I trying to find it. that little unicorn that's going to yeah. tell my kids what's really happening. I love that. I love that. Um, so for moms who would be like, um, I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you tell us, because I know on your website, you offer a service um, yeah. like this. Can you can you talk about that? Because I know there's some busy moms out there that would love to kind of push the easy button on getting a more, you know, um, broad, uh, including more voices in yeah. the homeschool this year. So, so yeah, I have a couple options. Um, one, I, I have heritage packs. I have six of them and they basically are all a full year of a lesson guide for a certain area of black history or African culture. Um, except for one is 24 weeks. All the rest of them are 36 weeks and, and they start with first grade and I have them going through sixth grade one of them, like there's one on civil rights. It has an extension um, for siblings that are even in middle school. So um, in the earlier years, it just covers getting to know people, like getting to know brown children and black children mm -hmm. and hearing about how they're living and what they're doing. And then I have a whole one on folk tales and fairy tales and myths and tall tales, all featuring black and brown characters. So, um, and then it goes on from there, just general black history, um, civil rights movement, the Harlem Renaissance. And so people can use those heritage packs and overlay them with whatever else they're using. The thing is that I, it's so many people were, what I was hearing was that they really like their curriculum. They, they yeah. don't dislike it, but they felt like it wasn't enough. It wasn't broad enough. And so this is kind of like an add on to allow you to continue using what you're using as long as it's not harmful, assuming it's not harmful right. for the kids, um, that you can include these additional, you know, lessons. And then the other thing is the customized book list. So for people who want to include black voices and brown voices into what their kids are doing and maybe they haven't found the heritage pack that is what they're looking for, I can create a custom book list that has things that will help with their history, but also with just general. Sometimes people come to me and they're just like, help me brown up my bookshelves, girl. <laughs> my kids just pick up off the shelf and curl up on the couch and read, you know, what should my 11 year old girl, what would she like to hear about? Or what do you think that she could read that? What's your daughter reading? That's what a lot of people really want to know. What's your daughter reading in her free time? And so I can customize yeah. that and kind of send that to them. So that's kind of just trying to help where I can um, in the areas that I know um, and see like, can we all you know, be in this together. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, and it's definitely like your heritage packs and the the customized book list. Like I've, I've not seen enough, you know, there's, there's lots of homeschool products, you know, being offered out there, but I've definitely not seen anything like that. So I am, I am super excited. We just purchased the customized book list. So I am so excited yeah. um, to see what you come up with for my two students. So it's going to be super fun. Um, so, awesome. and I definitely, we, we yard sale it too. My favorite is hitting up the thrift stores and um, it's usually my Saturday morning thing. Um, and we also have in our town, we have a, um, we have a group of retired educators and they have a, like a little trailer of books <laughs> and they just kind of like will set it up around town in different spots and whenever I see it set up I like go to it and just try to pick you know whatever we can that's going along with um you know whatever we're doing in history or you know yeah. whatever so um so yeah we definitely we definitely kind of piecemeal it together over that's here awesome. and I and I feel like our our bookshelves are constantly changing because even when I get some of those books, they'll sit on the shelf and my kids just don't ever pick them up. It's, you know, it's not yeah. something that really interested them. And so yeah. um, when I clean them out every year, they go and then we have space for new stuff to come in. So, yeah. So, yeah. That's fine. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. 
That's cool. <laughs> well, Amber, thank you so, so much. This has been awesome. Um, so um, the full, like your full um, interview with lots more questions that I asked you about homeschooling um, will be up on my blog um, along with this video. And um, I will also link to all your, your blog, social media, um, your shop, everything, so that people know all the ways they can keep up with you. So. Very cool. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank it was you. delightful. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, no problem. It was a blast. You have a great rest of your day. Okay, you do the same. All right. Bye. Bye.